test, test. All right. So uh, it's a pleasure to see how many people are interested in machine learning nowadays. So thank you for coming. And let us do a short introduction. My name is Serge Haziev, and I'm head of intelligent enterprise at a company called SoftServe. And uh, intelligent enterprise actually is an umbrella of BI, big data, AI, and uh, IoT services. And my partner in crime today is Yuri Milovanov. Yeah, hello everybody. The guy on the right is myself, just in case. Uh, my name is Yuri Milonov. I'm a data science practice lead for Saucer, where I'm leading on our AI and machine learning services and projects. And today I'll try to introduce you to the basics of AI and machine learning and try to demystify some of the myths that we have about those technologies and maybe get you some intuition about how it works. Super. All right, so uh, a couple of words about SoftServe. We are a young company, only 25 years, and uh, right now we have uh, even more than uh, 5,000 passionate professionals in uh, software development services. So uh, that's it about us today. So don't want to you know, uh, talk much about that marketing slides. And today we are going to talk about machine learning solution design and the main topic would be to how to translate business use cases, business requirements, if you will, into a design decisions. And algorithm is one of the design decisions that machine learning expert or an architect should make, right? So uh, we are going to play a game. So this is a gamified exercise, and you have uh, so raise hand if you don't have uh, cards. So everyone has cards, right? Excellent. So those cards actually will be a tool for today, and they help guide you to understand business requirements and to map out them to technological solution. For beginners, this is a great start. Introducing you know, machine learning concepts so that you can understand that field. And for even for experienced practitioners, those cards can represent some novelty. So they can have some tips which you can learn from you know, some particular algorithms and understand where that uh, algorithm fits or what problem, for example, uh, you know, can be solved using uh, that or another algorithm. So how many? Practitioners we have here in, the, in machine learning. In machine learning, yeah. All right, so uh, quite a few. Uh, and bear with us. We are going to provide some of uh, machine learning fundamentals, so that we set up a ground for everyone in this uh, room. And uh, Yuri will be talking uh, about machine learning concepts. So that's you know it won't take long. So. Uh, and don't fall asleep, please, before we start our game. All right, and short quiz. What is the name of this company in AI field? So any guess? Uh, not Google, unfortunately. So Google is more stable, I would say, right? So here, this company had a plateau for many years and then started growing like crazy. Which one? NVIDIA, bingo, yeah. So this is NVIDIA, and if you had put 100K, for example, you would have received 1 million today, just a side note. Uh, and actually, uh, this is a great representation of current anticipation or expectations in, in AI, right? So uh, NVIDIA is not only a, uh, a video card company, but nowadays it's AI company, and that growth is not only about crypto, uh, cryptocurrency. So, <laughs> so AI is a major factor here. A brief recap of AI progress. So AI as a term was coined by John McCarthy in the uh, 1950s. And this gentleman is known for invention of least programming language. And within four decades, there were attempts to automate many aspects in human life. But unfortunately, with no visible results. 
So there are at least two reasons for that. One of them is lack of computational power, and another, slow advances of AI methods. Until machine learning revolutionized that field. So machine learning actually is a bottom-up approach, right? So before that, the prevailing approach was top-down, meaning that there was a, you know, a magician, uh, a scientist, and actually, you know, who was looking for a, a magic formula that was like statistical modeling or uh, expert uh, systems looked like, right? So machine learning turned that concept to contrary direction, so that the system can learn itself from provided data. And it also changed the role of researcher, of the role of uh, an expert, so that the expert now is more like a trainer or a, a supervisor rather than you know alchemist or, or some magician. And deep learning, so how many of you heard about deep learning? Yeah, I uh, supposed that uh, this will be like that, here in Boston especially. So um, yeah, in Cambridge. And uh, deep learning is a paramount of machine learning right now, right? So uh, once again, AI is a, an umbrella term Machine learning is a method of AI, and deep learning is a technique of machine learning. So there are myths and fiction about artificial beings, just quickly, going back into history. So um, robot is one of them, golem in Bible, and someone believes that Sumerian Anunnaki created the first man. So uh, if we are artificial beings, perhaps it explains why we are trying to create something similar to us. So the current state of AI is pretty like this, and this is highly speculative picture, I would say, right? The speculation is around number of neurons and comparison between biological systems and devices. So you may see that uh, you know a good cloud uh, computing devices are somewhere close to, to mouse in terms of uh, intelligence. And that's fine, right? So I mean that this picture represents the current state, but uh, you can see at least what, what progress is possible from one standpoint. From another standpoint, it would be a fallacy to wait until AI will reach human performance and only then starting to, you know, uh, using it for business uh, use cases. So it will be just too late. But AI nowadays is exceptionally good in narrow tasks. So it can outperform human, like ice frog, like uh, frog's eyesight, for example, is better than human. In the same way, machine learning algorithm can be better in image recognition, in speech recognition, and in uh, driving cars, for example. So today, we are going to tackle this business problem. So this is a, a recommender system, if you like. Uh, so here we have uh, two funny banners for simplicity. And our goal will be to improve machine learning system by selecting a, an algorithm, so the best matching algorithm, so that you know, we can uh, improve so-called CTR. Right, so you, you heard, I think that you heard uh, about this concept, CTR. So CTR is a uh, very uh, basic formula. It's a number of click-throughs divided by number of impressions. So that's it. So it's our, so we need to increase probability. So we need to increase CTR uh, in our challenge. And here you may see the market action diagram. So we have uh, uh, hundreds of web servers those web servers collect logs. Those logs represent some kind of behavior of uh, our users. And we have some features, like demographics, for example, like uh, IP address, uh, and so on and so on, so that we can use those features to train our system, to train our machine learning system. And the machine learning system will make a prediction. Is it a good banner for that particular user, for example, or not, so that it will be you know, selecting uh, the best appropriate banner based on user data. All right, 
And now, Yuri. Yes, so now, actually, before trying to solve this problem, business problem using AI and machine learning, let's try, let's think, uh, why, why, why do we actually need machine learning here, right? We have quite a good traditional software engineering techniques why we can just hand code our solution, right? And the problem is that for many AI-related problems, that is not actually feasible. Uh, first of all, uh, it's because most of those problems, they deal with infinite uh, problem space, right? For instance, let's say you want to do some sort of sentiment analysis, right, against Twitter data, and you want, want to understand whether your customer kind of uh, mentioned your product in a good or bad way, right? But there are infinite number of way, ways how to say good or bad things, right? So it's not possible to cover uh, all those cases using traditional software engineering. And another problem is that most of those problems, they're poorly defined, right? So we still do not know how our brains solve those problems. So we cannot really come up with a well-defined algorithm where we have some number of steps and stages that's not actually possible with uh, AI problems. That's why we need something else. We need uh, machine learning here so that instead of developer, who writes the code for us, right? We, we have algorithm who write this code, right? So this is kind of an analogy how machine learning is different from traditional software engineering, although they deal with the kind of same uh, or similar types of problems, right? Uh, machine learning is just a tool that helps tackle some of the problems that cannot be solved using uh, our traditional techniques. So here are some basic blocks that are common for every possible machine learning problem. We always have machine learning algorithm which tries to leverage or actually analyze or process historical data to come up with a model. Where, and here a model, uh, once again, if you compare this traditional software engineering model is a, our code, right? Instead of lines of code, we have number of matrices and some weird way how to multiply them, but still it's a code, right, that we execute. And we want this model to use uh, on a new data to predict what would be kind of, uh, what would be the behavior or what would be our output based on new value, on new data, right? And you may also notice that our historical data is divided into two subsets, right? We have training data and we have testing data. And that's actually a very important concept for machine learning because we don't want just to memorize, we don't want our algorithm just to memorize everything that is in our historical data. We want our algorithm to extract some sort of generalizable knowledge, something that is common, something that can be applied uh, out of this training data set, right? So we kind of simulate this setting by dividing into two subsets, training on a, uh, on a training data, and then test uh, the performance of our model based on testing data and see how our algorithm will behave in real life. And to be honest, uh, in real life, it's always different even from a testing set. Sometimes we have a separate third uh, data set that we use for validation. So yeah, but this concept, this concept of training a test set is kind of crucial trick that we have to use here. Now let's think about what types of learning are there and what types of learning can be applied to our particular problem, right? So in machine learning community, we consider three basic types of learning and uh, today we're gonna cover just two of them. So the first one is supervised learning. And why is it supervised? It's because we always have both our input data and ground truth data, right? And the goal of our algorithm is to kind of discover this connection or relationships between our input data and output data, right? So for instance, you have a data set with the uh, houses and their features such as number of square meters, locations, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And we also have prices for those houses, the price that those house, houses uh, have been sold, right? And what we want to do with this data, we want to develop a model that will predict or recommend a price for a new house that is not in our data set. And in this case, our house features would be our input data and uh, the actual house price would be output data and the algorithm will try to see how those things are connected and what actually influences the price to go up or down, right? 
Another example, another type of uh, machine learning is unsupervised learning. And as you may guess, right, in this, in this setting, we don't have any supervision. We have only input data, and the goal of our algorithm would be to discover what is the underlying structure of our data, what kind of patterns are there, and provide them to us to, to, to use them for our predictions, for our, uh, for our business goals. So here is a kind of typical illustration of uh, unsupervised, typical example of unsupervised learning. So imagine you have a bunch of customer transactions, and you want to leverage them and see what are the, what are the natural grouping within, what are the natural kind of, uh, what kind of cluster are there? M maybe you have some group of customers similar to each other. Maybe there are many groups of them. You've no, you have no idea how many groups are there. You want your algorithm to discover it. And to summarize, here is a, another more visual illustration of supervised and unsupervised learning. So this is the same problem, right? We have the same number of observation, ob observations, but in the first case, in the supervised case, we already have labels associated with each observation. We have uh, red and blues, right? And we want our algorithm to learn some sort of uh, bounding around those kind of groups and then classify whether the new point would be blue or red. And to the right, you see the same example, but from unsupervised standpoint, we don't have any labels, but still the information is in there, right? You can, you can kind of guess that there are two groups, maybe there are two classes, and maybe the new point that will be somewhere to the right will be closer to that group, and maybe it also will belong to that group. So this is kind of, kind of the main difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. There is also a third type, which is called reinforcement learning. And this is, I would say, the least popular type of learning because we still kind of in the process of discovering the most efficient way how to do it. And another problem is that it's by design interactive type of learning. So the algorithm in the reinforcement learning uh, setting, it actually interacts with, it, with the environment and tries to learn from, from this interaction. And for some use cases, it might be kind of uh, expensive to train your, let's say, self-driven car in real life, let it go as it is and see how, and try to learn how to drive, you know? So that's why for now we don't have any uh, kind of good, well, I would say we have quite a few, uh, but not so many uh, good examples of applying reinforcement learning, but it's quite hot in robotics, for instance. It's one of the most popular techniques these days in robotics. So. If we get back to our business problem with the CTR and those two banners and recommender systems that we will try to design user using our cards, so what do you think? What kind of learning can we apply here, whether it's supervised or unsupervised? And just to recap uh, our problem definition, we have two banners. We have historical data where we have user features. Let's let's think that there are 20 features per each uh, user, right? Such as device, IP, and so on and so forth. And we have banner, we, we have actual impression, right? So this banner was shown to this user, and, this, and whether this user clicked or uh, didn't click to that banner. So zero stands for no click, and one stands for click. So what do you think? Uh, what, what time of learning can we apply here? Why supervised? Right, right. We already have this information in our data. We already have this information whether user clicked or uh, didn't click. And it would be silly and just get rid of this information and consider this an unsupervised learning. We definitely won't leverage this information and actually provide better results, right? So now it's time to introduce our cards. Uh, in your deck, you have three different type of cards. There are four cards with a green back. Those represent problem types. We have four basic problem types in our game. There are eight, I think it's eight, cards with a blue back. back. They represent algorithm families. And algorithm family, in our case, is just a group of similar algorithms. Sometimes it's even the same algorithm, but with some sort of specifics or maybe some uh, modification of the same algorithm. And the last one is actual algorithm that we uh, will try to apply to our problem, right? So here is a, another illustration. 
four problems, eight families, and a bunch of algorithms. And I would highly recommend you to group or reshuffle your cards so you have uh, green cards, blue cards, and red cards in uh, separate groups because it will make everything much easier for you later, later on. All right, so now let's start with our first decision. Actually, second decision. We already decided that this, we want to apply supervised learning to this case, but now let's think what kind of, what type of problem we are dealing with, right? And just to give you another kind of uh, idea about why we're actually doing this, you, you can see that we actually, by each iteration, we kind of narrow down the scope uh, or search space that, that we are looking into, right? So here we have about 20 algorithms, but in reality, it's hundreds of algorithms, right? And there is no way to try any, uh, all of them, right? You have to narrow down and come up with a couple of candidates for your solution, and those candidates you will test and see whether they, you're satisfied with the results or not. That's actually what we're gonna do today. Uh, so what, kind of, what type of problem we have in our game? And I think those problems, they are basic for, for machine learning in general. So the first type of problem is classification. And the goal of the classification algorithm is, generally speaking, to assign a uh, discrete label to our observation. We already know how many labels are there. For instance, we know that there is uh, fraudulent transaction and not fraudulent transaction. Or, for instance, we know that there is spam or not spam. Or we know that we have four basic type of customers. Or so any type of classes that we have. The, uh, key point that though the number of those classes is limited. And next type of problem, which is called regression, is quite similar, but instead of discrete label, uh, we are trying to assign continuous value, right? And uh, uh, in machine learning community, we quite often say that classification problem is about whether a particular event will happen or not, and regression is uh, more about how this event will influence, uh, I don't know, my business, or what will be the influence of this event. And the example of regression problem can be predicting stock price or scoring a credit application, right? Or maybe estima estimated demand for, for some product. And both of these types of problems, they are considered to be supervised because we uh, always have this ground truth for our, uh, for our problem. And, uh, one of the examples of unsupervised learning might be clustering. We already covered it a bit, but in general, uh, the goal of the clustering is discover the natural grouping within your data. Uh, usually we don't know how many groups are there, and we try to uncover this for, from data. What would be the best grouping, right? Maybe there are four groups, maybe two, and see we have some sort of metrics how to define uh, kind of the quality of our grouping. And this type of problem, quite usually, uh, you can see, for instance, if you want to uh, discover kind of target groups in your, in your audience, right? For instance, you have some, some, some audience, and you want, you want to better understand your audience. You, you, you want to see some sort of high-level abstraction of your audience, see those groups, and what actually makes those, your kind of people in those groups similar to each other. Right? Or, for instance, in, uh, if you do some sort of geo-based analysis, you want to see whether your geo data is clustered, what are the clusters. For instance, you want to analyze check-ins right, from your application. And you, can, you, you may see that some of your check-ins are grouped in some locations. Maybe those locations are special in some way. And that might provide you some useful insights. And the last, but not the least, and I would say the trickiest one, is anomaly detection. And generally speaking, anomaly detection is about, it's a kind of two-step problem. First, we want to understand what is the expected pattern in our data, right? What is the expected behavior of our customer or of, I don't know, of our system. And then try to uncover some sort of deviation from this pattern. And this problem can be considered as both supervised and unsupervised. For instance, you already know that there is a really common type of fraud. You already have data labeled, annotated data, where you uh, experience this type of fraud, and you want to detect this type of fraud in real time to react uh, uh, correspondingly, right? But you know, those people, they, they also evolve. They create new types of fraud, and you also want to kind of detect those types, right? 
And in this case, you don't have any label data because it's new type of fraud. But still, this behavior will be kind of will be different from something you expected, and you can detect this deviation. So, in for our problem, let's get back to this problem. We have features, we have banners, or and it shows the actual impression. So the particular banner was sh shown to a particular user, and information whether this user clicked on this or not. So, what do you think? What kind of problem will fit? So we c you can use your cards if you need any kind of uh, clue. But in general, do you think it's anomaly detection? No. Maybe clustering? No, it's definitely not clustering because it's unsupervised and we already selected supervised. Uh, is it regression? Uh, classification, you think? Uh, yes, I would say this is the right answer. And actually, this question is a bit tricky because our and objective is CTR, right? That, that's what we're actually trying to optimize for, which is actually continuous value. But on a data level, we have quite binary classification, right? We have zero or one, and we want to we want to leverage this binary classification to predict for, for new users. So it's kind of, it can be considered from as both uh, regression and uh, classification, but I think that classification naturally fits much better than regression. Now let's try to use our cards. Uh, I'll try to briefly introduce you to, the, uh, to them. So uh, since we already kind of narrowed down this scope, we already know so that this is a classification type of problem. We need to select only those cards that are related to classification problem. And those cards are characterized by, by a blue circle in the top right corner. So for families, there should be five cards that represent classification uh, families. So I would recommend you to find those cards right now. And for algorithms, we have nine cards. And they, are all, they also, all of them, they have this blue circle in top right corner. So let's have a really short one minute break so you have some time to reshuffle your deck and select only those algorithms. In the meantime, if you have any questions, so sure, go ahead. Actually, it's, it's, it's a bit silly example, you know, because we just made it up, you know. And for instance, if you're over 50, it doesn't make sense which banner to show, right? So that's kind of obvious. But in general, we try to show two completely kind of complementary cases, right? So the choice of the banner depends on a taste or a preference of a particular user. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions so far? All right. So I think most of you already reshuffled your cards. Now we have, how many cards do we have in our hands? I think about 14 cards. And out of those 14 cards, uh, what we're going to do is select two candidates, two algorithm candidates from two different algorithm families that we will try to uh, apply to our problem and, and test the results. But what actually? What are the trade-offs? How can we how can we kind of compare one algorithm to another? What are our decision drivers, right? And it turns out that those drivers they naturally they can be naturally derived from our business definition, from our business problem. That's actually a way to connect an actual business use case with the algorithm, right? Uh, so for algorithm families, we have six different drivers. Uh, and uh, in your cards, you have this kind of table with characteristics for each of those drivers and a score. Uh, st the more, uh, the better, right? And uh, it means whether this particular algorithm is good or bad in, 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 in this particular characteristic. So uh, let's go quickly go through each of them. So first one, big data. It kind of uh, stands for ability of the algorithm to uh, to be applied to really large scale data sets. Uh, it may mean that there is a good 
uh, distributed implementation for this algorithm, or there are some algorithms that by design cannot be applied to large data sets, right? Because they, they're way too slow and there is, it doesn't make sense just to apply them. Small data, it's kind of another type of problem which we quite often deal with because for some types of problem, we don't have a lot of data. For instance, you want to uh, analyze or detect some re really rare event. You, you just can't collect a lot of data. You can try to augment, try to synthesize this data, but generally speaking, you are in a small data setting, right? And some of those algorithms, they, 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 they work better with small data. Science some of them not. So if, if small data is a problem for you, you have to uh, take into account this driver. In our case, th this is not the case. So we uh, gonna use only big data. So if you see that, uh, you may see that some of those are kind of bold. Bold mean that this driver is important for us. Imbalanced data is the next driver. Uh, why is it important to us? You know, it turns out that we can really easily, really easy, uh, come up with a quite accurate algorithm. Just assume that none of the banners will be clicked, you know? And uh, <laughs> it turns out that uh, you will be, your algorithm will be 90% correct, right? And you are good, my algorithm 90% correct. But that is not what we are trying to do, right? We wanna focus on those 10% uh, where we actually, uh, uh, there was actual click on an impression and we want our algorithm to focus on those. Uh, events, right? That some of the algorithms they have some sort of ability to tackle this issue, either to apply some sort of weights to specific classes, or they're generally more agnostic to this type of problem. Some of them are not, and in our case, is extremely important because uh, this pro usually such data sets they extremely biased or uh, skewed towards uh, one of the uh, most popular class, which is non-click. Uh, the next driver is result interpretation. It's, it's not important for us for our particular problem, but there are many problems where it's quite important to have human-friendly interpretation of the results, right? Sometimes it's even more important than the actual result because we want to understand our problem better. Be because for instance, let's say you're a physician. It's not enough for you to know that you have to prescribe this drug just because you have a activation slightly more than threshold and a short level of your neural network, it doesn't make any sense to you, right? You want to understand what's actually, what's, what's under the hood of this decision. And maybe that, that will be even more important for you than actual drug that uh, your algorithm recommends you to prescribe. So this is not the case for us. We do not care about this. We, whatever algorithm, our algorithm thinks would be the best, we will show to our user because we, we are in real time setting, we have to decide really fast. Uh, online learning, it's quite important uh, for our case, but uh, we don't gonna use it. But in general, it means whether uh, the particular algorithm family is able to do what we call online learning or learning from, from small batches, right? Because some of those algorithms that we have in our deck, they can, you, you cannot, learn them on a small batches. Every time you have new data, you have to retrain on a whole uh, training data set that you have. For instance, if your data set is a couple of terabytes, right, you can afford, actually, you don't have actually enough computational power to retrain your model on a whole data set every day or, I don't know, every, every hour, right? You want to, but still you want to leverage this new data and react to it in real time. And some of the algorithms, they have this ability, some of them, uh, don't, and if this is the case for you, you definitely should consider online learning as a driver, but for this case, let's assume that we do not care. We have unlimited computational power in Google Cloud, right? So we do not care about online learning. And ease of use, it's also important driver. It doesn't mean that we are silly or lazy, right? It's just because for some algorithms, it's quite hard to, uh, to get a, kind of optimal performance. You have to deal with a, quite a big number of hyperparameters that you have to manually choose. And for some problem, the number of hyperparameters might be even larger than the number of data points that you have. For instance, in neural networks, in deep learning, you have to decide how many layers you're gonna use. You have to decide what kind of activation function will be, for how many neurons in each la layer, how, what kind of activation function, so on and so forth. It, the number of hyperparameters for a modern uh, neural network might be millions, right? And you have to manually uh, try to find the best set of those hyperparameters. It takes a lot of time. If uh, you are kind of under time pressure and time, you, you have to release uh, 
our initial kind of model as, as fast as possible, you better choose something that will you will have quite a reasonable performance right away, and there is still some room for improvements through tuning and so on and so forth. And for algorithms, we have quite the same uh, quite the same information. We have a set of drivers. Those are different uh, from uh, the drivers that we have for uh, families, but each algorithm inherits uh, corresponding drivers from, from, from its family, right? So the first driver is accuracy. Of course, we do care about accuracy. I think it's one of the most important drivers for us, but once again, sometimes accuracy might be tricky. Uh, training speed is also quite important for us because we want to, uh, we deal with a quite large data set and we want to our algorithm to train really fast. And prediction speed, I would say, or, or performance, right? It's even more important for us because we, so imagine a imagine new user uh, coming to your website, right? And you have to decide what banner to show. In our case, we have just two banners, but in, in real life, there are thousands of, dry, uh, of banners, right? And you have to score each of those banners for every given user. So you have to do it really fast. So your prediction speed should be really fast. Uh, the last two are not relevant to our problem, uh, but still it's quite important for many problems, or fit and resistance, for instance. So generally speaking, it's uh, it's uh, ability of the algorithm to generalize, right? So whether this, uh, this algorithm, so th there's a typical problem in machine learning, it's called overfitting, when, when instead of deriving generalized knowledge, your algorithm just memorize everything and provide you 100 percent accuracy on your training data, but once you provide it with a new data, with the real data, it doesn't actually work. So it's quite important when your data is small, but for big data sets, we believe that this is not the case and we don't have to take it into account for our particular problem. And the last driver is probabilistic interpretation, which is also not important for our case, but might be for many other. It means whether an uh, algorithm provides a probabilistic interpretation of, of the result. Uh, for instance, if it's not enough for you to know whether there will be rain tomorrow or not, it's, it's more impo it's important for you to know what is the probability of the rain tomorrow so you can somehow penalize your risks and so on and so forth. So you have to have this probability instead of just label zero or one for rain or not rain. So, uh, in our case, that's not important, but uh, yeah, this is the case for many problems. So now we will really use our car. So this is gonna be quite long exercise, I think about five to 10 minutes, where we will try to select two candidates that we going to test out of uh, those that we have. And we're gonna use the following drivers. For families, if you wanna use big data, imbalanced data, and ease of use. And for uh, algorithms, we're gonna use accuracy, training speed, and prediction speed. Now, I highly recommend you to uh, do this exercise in pairs because you have to do some math, calculate, and so on and so forth. So I, I would recommend you to do it in pairs and it's always better to collaborate, right? So let's have a short break, uh, for, not, not actual break. Let's, uh, I'm going to give you some time to uh, select your candidates. In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free. It's break for Yuri. <laughs> yeah, it's break for me, right. <laughs> Once again, two candidates from two different algorithm families. Two algorithms, uh, algorithm candidates. If we can turn on some music, loud music, so. If 
you don't have any practice, practical experience in the machine learning, the exercise that you are going through right now, it's kind of the usual process that actually uh, is common for, so those decisions that you're making right now, is, they are quite common and that's what we go through for, for many problems. So you can get some sort of idea. Why do you select one algorithm or other? And in your deck, you, uh, you, well, you also have, for, for instance, artificial neural networks, which are quite hot these days, and people used to think that they can solve any given problem. And you will see that this is not a kind of obvious winner for our case. We're gonna start voting for the winner in a minute. So raise your hand if you already selected two candidates. Uh, I think we should should wait a little bit more than one minute.
Let's do another health check. So raise your hand if you're ready with the, your candidates. Yeah, I think we're good to go. So we have nine different algorithms. So who selected uh, either linear or non-linear SVM as one of the candidates? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, how about uh, Bayesian Nail Classifier? One, two. Okay. Uh, do we have any anyone who selected logistic regression? Oh, and we have a, we have a leader. Okay. Uh, classification and regression trees. Okay. We have a competitor. Uh, K nearest neighbors. No one. Right. Okay, uh, and another variation of K nearest neighbors, which is radius uh, neighbors. Did anyone select it? Okay, and the last two, random forest. Uh, that was kind of obvious. And maybe someone selected multi-layer perceptron, which is actually a simple version of a neural network. All right, so we selected our candidates. So now it's it's kind of, we, we kind of just went through this exercise, thought exercise, thought experiment. Now kind of the obvious kind of next step would be try to prototype. Once we narrow down this kind of scope and we have two candidates, we can afford testing both of them. And uh, in, real in real life, we will have to do this by yourself, right? But we've done it for you. Actually for all of those uh, candidates, or all of those algorithms, we, we actually train them on a publicly available data set, which kind of represent our problem. Here are the results that we got. We have random forest, who actually a winner here, and, and, and our results, they actually prove this, right? So random forest, it's quite, it's quite good algorithm, especially for uh, uh, the data that we have. If your data is not really high dimensional, if you're not dealing with images, and or any other type of or audio signal, any other type of high dimensional data. Random forest is, if, if you're familiar with a platform called Kaggle, it's a data science competition platform. And I think that random forest or it's kind of its variation, which is called uh, gradient boosting, it's one of the most popular technique that people apply there. Uh, the second place is uh, K nearest neighbor, surprisingly. And you may see that although performance of this algorithm is quite good, the prediction time is the worst one out of all of them, right? And uh, the problem is that K nearest neighbors is not actually an algorithm in pure way, right? It's rather storage, where you have to store all of your, uh, all your training data in the memory. And once you get a new example, you try to find some number of similar examples, what we call K neighbor, K neighbors, right? Nearest neighbors. If you can, number of K or number of neighbors can be up to you, right? You have to select this number. Either you can 10, 20, it's quite easy to tune and decide what would be the best number. But generally speaking, it's highly computationally expensive and memory inefficient algorithm. And for some cases when your data is not that big, it can be used, but for such a large scale problem, I wouldn't consider this algorithm. The third one is logistic regression. And it's actually surprised me uh, a bit. And it was a winner. Ah, uh, oh, by the way, here you see, you see five different columns, training time, prediction time. And you have two types of accuracy, uh, initial accuracy and final accuracy. So what we've done, we've trained each of those algorithms using some default set or kind of guided or expert defined set of hyperparameters and we got our initial result right and after that we did a sort of a grid search over the number of of hyperparameters it tried to select the best one that will provide the best performance and you may see that for instance logistic regression was a winner on this initial stage but once we applied some hyperparameter tuning, the performance of this algorithm was a bit lower than for random forest, which is our winner. And another interesting, actually two interesting insights from this table is, for instance, multi-layer perceptron. You will see that on the initial stage, it was the worst algorithm out of all of them. 
But once we did this kind of really expensive, you will see it's, uh, we spent quite a lot of time. This time, uh, it's in, uh, I think it's in minutes. Uh, uh, so once we did this quite extensive uh, hyperparameter tuning, the result was much better. And this is the case quite often with neural networks. You have to spend a lot of time on, on selecting those hyperparameters if your model is really complex. Uh, and the second interesting insight is a uh, support vector machine. Uh, and you, you will see that you see that from so the training time and tuning time for this algorithm was quite a long, I think the longest time. And the problem is that by, by design, this algorithm is, wasn't developed for big data. It was quite popular back in 90s when we didn't have a lot of data, but still we'll, we have, we have to leverage this data and, and uh, kind of still do some machine learning. And at that time, it was the best algorithm. It per performs quite well when your data is not really big. For instance, you have 20,000 examples, right? But in our case, it's uh, millions of examples. And you, you can see that there is no way to, uh, to train this, this, this algorithm. I would say that I think we even had to uh, subsample our da data sets so that we don't have to wait forever until it's uh, uh, until it trained for for tuning. So this actually what we have just uh, went through. This is actually a typical process and typical design uh, decisions that we make for designing a machine learning solution. So first we try to understand what kind of problem we are dealing with. Then we try once we kind of narrow down the scope to a particular problem type. We try to select uh, some number of uh, candidates that we're going to test. And then after testing, we, we decide which algorithm we're going to choose. And this algorithm selection, in most cases, is purely based on our business drivers and our business requirements, or can be derived in some way from our business problem. So if you are not an expert in machine learning and looking for a way how to start your AI and machine learning journey, Google is a good starting point. Uh, TensorFlow these days is one of the, I would say, most popular tools for distributed machine learning. And uh, TensorFlow's website itself, it's one of the best uh, educational resources. Although I've been in this field for quite a while, I still learned a lot of things from, from the documentation. So I would recommend you to go there. There are different tutorials for a basic level, for more advanced level. And there are a bunch of publicly available data sets that you can try and get some practical experience with machine learning. And once you train your model, you would, might also want to, to, to scale it out, right? You, want, you might want to apply it to a much larger data set to expose your model to your application. And Google, Google Cloud Machine Learning is quite a good choice for this because the time it takes to deploy your model that you develop on your laptop to a cloud and expose to and apply on a, on your large scale data set is actually hours minutes depends on how much time how focused you are right so it's it's actually amazing we didn't have such such solution such kind of tools before we had to develop custom solution but now that we have cloud machine learning personally i'm really happy because i can focus on the machine learning i don't have to focus on those infrastructural things and if you want to get some sort of idea on what is the state of the art in your, uh, in your problem space, for instance, you're working with natural language processing, speech recognition, or computer vision, you can try one of the pre-built bundle solutions from Google Cloud, either natural language API, or speech API, or vision API, or radio intelligence API, or if your use case fits into the capabilities of those services, you can even use for, for your problem itself. You don't have to develop your custom model. Maybe your problem is quite common, and there is already a solution to your problem on Google Cloud. You don't have to train anything. You can leverage those services trained on a Google data and use them right away. Uh, and it's quite, quite, quite useful for many use cases, uh, especially for I would personally recommend to look into natural language PI because I, in my experience, my practice, I use it a lot. So yeah, we, I think, I hope at least, we, you learned something from uh, this session. And now let's think what are, the, what, kind of, what are the key takeaways from what we just went through. Yeah, thank you, Yuri. And uh, key takeaways from this uh, exercise, from this uh, 
gamification session. So machine learning design, as you've seen, uh, is a, an interactive and agile process. So uh, you need to have several steps in order to come up into uh, a particular design solution, right? So the machine learning cards help select candidate algorithms and get rid of some uh, you know, paths which can lead you or mislead you in, in wrong direction. So, uh, so that uh, you can analyze what is your business requirements, for example, and go deeper into the particular design decision. So that actually is uh, you know, the goal of machine learning cards to help you in this journey. So prototyping is necessary to validate design decisions. And uh, in machine learning, as you know, practice is far ahead from theory. So theory is just you know, trying to catch uh, all those uh, practical, I would say, uh, results. But actually, you have to validate decisions anyway. So once you selected uh, a couple of algorithms and we recommend to select two or three algorithms, then run experiments, run prototyping, and select what would be the winner from that uh, prototype. And as Yuri shown, Google Cloud provides a wide variety of uh, AI and ML solutions, and they are you know, quite easy to get, and you can use them from prototyping to a production deployment. All right. And yeah, we have some time for Q&A. Any questions? So, yeah. Um, so if you're getting your data from Google Cloud, where does that data come from originally? How is that determined, where your, your data set? So the data set that we use for our exercise, it's a publicly available data set. If you go to Kaggle, you'll see there are a bunch of, there are many different publicly available data sets that you can use. There are some solutions that you can already develop for this data set that you can try, or maybe you have some ideas how can you improve the state of the art algorithm for this particular problem. So this, the results that we got were from, uh, from this publicly available data set. The question? Um, I was wondering, do you have, I mean, these cards were really nice and it was a great interactive Thank exercise. Um, super curious, is there an interactive version of the sort of rating uh, that you have for these different algorithm families and things that somebody could sort of say, okay, well, I know the basics of what I'm interested in, you know, can you actually recommend, uh, you know, essentially the best fit? Yeah, so the main goal of this, these cards is rather educational, right? So we want to uh, involve more and more people with different background. So it's actually, doesn't matter what is your background, whether you're a business representative or you're a technician or you're a researcher, in some way you still deal or have some sort of interaction with machine learning solutions and you have to have some knowledge or idea or intuition about those, those solutions. So this is the main goal of those cards, but you know, surprisingly, We've used them even for our internal uh, ideations to actually, first of all, test our, 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 our card game and actually to, to do it in a more interactive way, to compete with each other, to come up with more and more and more ideas. So yeah, I think this is a practical tool that you can use and we will keep updating those cards. This is an initial version. I think if, uh, sometime we'll release a new one. So um, they will be also available on the uh, website smartdecision.com where you will be able to develop, a to develop d download a digital copy of them and print it out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. <laughs> um, I was curious what your opinion is on tools like Data Robot that do the uh, algorithm selection for you instead of going through this process of identifying what's best for the use case? You know, uh, in general, there is a kind of a kind of huge trend uh, which that we call AutoML, right? And uh, Google Cloud itself, they have an AutoML service where you can actually use machine learning to select a machine learning model. And it works to some extent, but still you have to you there is a lot of work that shouldn't be 
should, as you as you may notice, a lot of decisions are based on a business goals, right? On your business objectives, and there is still there should be still an expert, a subject matter expert that will guide, that will make all those decisions. It's still kind of impossible for uh, machine learning to purely do make those decisions because a lot of things depends on a business, and there is no way to incorporate that knowledge into machine learning. But I think eventually we'll have. Uh, AutoML, and we will train AutoMLs, and we'll have AutoMLs that train AutoML, and <laughs> we always need to get deeper. Hi. Uh, so the in the real time, when you pull the data, it's stored in the RDBMS or in the Google Cloud or some cloud infrastructure. So once again, this is a kind of educational exercise. We it's rather thought experiment, right? But depending on your use case, you, you can store your uh, your data on Google Cloud. There are multiple ways how to store your data on Google Cloud. It depends on, a, on a, how often you want to access your data, how big is your data, what is the structure of your data, whether it's structured or non-structured. And there's quite a good guidance what, what would be the best. There is kind of a decision tree available on Google Cloud that you can use to decide what, what will be the best storage for your algorithm, depending on how you how how and how often you want to access your data and for what what kind of what is your goal. But yeah, uh, there are multiple ways how to do it. But will it be economically feasible? Uh, because if you have different databases for its maintenance or you create separate schema for each database. Well, it's it's it's, it's a really low-level question. It it really depends on the, on your problem. If you describe your problem, maybe uh, after this session we can discuss this. So I I, I need to uh, to know more about the problems that you're talking about. Yeah. So we, we can talk. Uh, after. Mm -hmm. uh, just curious, has it ever happened where uh, a project you were working on, you selected some uh, algorithm, and then you know. Uh, down the line, you realize that probably wasn't the best solution, so you had to go back and back to the whiteboard and you know uh, then select again the algorithm. Yes, quite often, and that's actually why we uh, designed or developed this methodology, right? Because we want to do if if we're gonna fail, we better fail in the very beginning, right? We don't want to. Uh, fail on the in the very end right we want to see what kind of narrow down the scope and 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 uh, get rid of everything that we don't want to use and try only some subset of, the, of those so it's quite open the case uh, quite often the case and what is more important in data science and machine learning there are too many algorithms too many techniques that maybe some of them are, I, I don't even know that there are right for instance in some if you work in some specific domain there are some algorithms that i even haven't heard about you know if you work in some acoustic modeling for instance there are algorithms machine learning algorithms that are applied only there you know or for popular or only there so yeah it's quite often the case you always have to do a lot of research and see try to leverage uh, see whether whether someone have tried to approach your problem and tried to learn from that. So yeah, I would say that. So uh, the more practice you have, the more the more you get some sort of intuition what would be the best choice. But generally speaking, sometimes it happens. All right. Any more questions? I need more questions. Can you can you discuss a few use cases you know that you've worked on that are you know production ready you know uh, unless those are proprietary that you your team has worked on um, in, a, in a bigger scale that are being implemented right now and you know that we as users you know on the back end they are being used but we don't know that are being used um, for the ML AI side of things. Yeah, sure. So for instance, one of the projects that we've worked on was the. Uh, web content classification engine for one of the largest networking network money network device manufacturers so they 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 one of their core services is to uh, kind of restrict the some particular type of content right restrict the web traffic based on based on its, its type whether actually not not always restrict sometimes they want to prioritize some particular type of, of traffic right so what we developed for them was a solution how to classify every uh, any domain every website uh, according to 83 different categories there were three different tiers of those categories driven by 
their business logic, their tier one, uh, which consists of the most important ones, for instance, if it's adult content, so something that people quite often want to uh, use or, I mean, restrict, right? Uh, not actually use. Uh, <laughs> there is tier two, which uh, also was quite important, but maybe less, and tier three, which we actually, we, we, we could compromise, right, performance on, on those classes. Yes, right, right. And it wasn't actually hierarchical, it's rather we, we have different weights, we, we motivated our algorithm to focus more on those, on the tier one, we have less weights, less penalties to the tier two, and we didn't apply any penalty to tier three, but that's actually uh, quite, quite, quite common situation. And in the end, it was a solution that I think a lot of you use right now. I don't know if you have a device in your company developed by this company, but one of our clients, I think it restricts your traffic based on our solution. Thank you. So um, taking one step back, I'm trying to understand a, uh, a bit more of like um, your business model. So are you like a partnership, like a, a, a are you working in partnership with the Google AI um, platform to provide the machine learning solution design for your uh, customers? Is that the way you work? Or? Serge, do you want? I'm a technical guy. He's a business yeah, guy. I can address it. So we're, yeah, we are partner with Google, and uh, we have also partnership with other companies. So uh, we are software advisory in, in terms of uh, you know how to design your software, how to uh, create solution and actually implement it and uh, roll out. So actually end to end. So I have a follow up question. Uh, I'm curious about uh, uh, coming back to data. Um, what are the most uh, like the most challenging problems you observe uh, in terms of acquiring high quality data sets to train your models? And what do you see? What do you think of like um, how? the technology environment, like um, both companies and academia world are, are trying to um, uh, reduce the de dependency on data sets. Um, what do you think of like how the human in the loop um, uh, training data uh, practice is going to be impacted by the technology involvement? Yeah, so actually I think that data, there's, there is no way to, to be less dependent on the data because data is a crucial ingredient here, right? So, and data quality, you're right, is quite an important issue that we have right now. Uh, I, I would say that the most common problem is generally speaking noise that we have not only in data in our life in general, and that, that kind of influence uh, our kind of practice and our, our solutions a lot. Another problem is that it's quite important to understand what's the nature of your data. How, how, how did you get this data, right? Maybe, maybe it's kind of biased and you, and you, or maybe you get just a subset of, of, of the actual data and it, it's not representative at all, right? So whether your data that you have represent the nature of your problem, it's quite important to know because actually, for instance, for that project that I've just described, that was one of the issues that we faced with. We have a training data that we used. We train our model. It was 90%, 88% uh, accurate, right? Uh, out of uh, uh, 83 categories. And we were good. But once we rolled it out, we realized that the actual performance was less than 50%. And it turns out that the um, kind of uh, methodology that uh, our client used to annotate this data wasn't really representable because they, they manually annotated only uh, those uh, observations that uh, their previous solution uh, didn't manage to, uh, to classify, right? Because it was highly biased data, right? And we, ha and we realized it only once we released uh, our initial version, right? So it's quite important to understand what's the nature of your data and whether this, your training data represent the actual real life. And in terms of data quality, it's also quite important to uh, to kind of see whether whether the data consists enough information uh, to to come up with, with with to actually to solve your problem, right? Because you have to understand what what is the predictive power of this data. Maybe it's not enough to have just these data points. You have to collect more data. Maybe you have to you have to generate more data. Maybe you have to buy more data because there are a lot of data providers. And I think that's another problem that, that we have right now uh, because quite often uh, our client, they think that 
they already have all the data, but once we start to do what we call data assessment, we realize that actually it's, it's not enough to have just this uh, data. And uh, another problem is that a lot of uh, business processes, they are actually stored only in the, in the brains of, of experts, right? They're, they're not, they're, there is no way to derive it from the data. That's another problem, right? Because not everything, not all the knowledge can, uh, is in the data and we have to validate that. Is it answer to, to your question? Yeah, super. We got two more questions. Just to follow on ah. to that uh, bias problem where you might have a s selection bias in your data and, it, and it's not representative, what if it's the algorithm that's biased? Uh, well, we, so any, any machine learning project that we start, we start with uh, what we call data exploration, right? So we uh, usually we realize that our data is biased before we actually start in applying some sort of machine learning or started training, right? But you're right, so it's, it's quite important to, uh, to understand whether there are any biases in our model because uh, we want our machine learning model to be better than us, right? We don't want to incorporate our common biases into our models. And since most of the state-of-the-art models, they are so complex so that in many cases, they're black boxes. It's quite hard to understand what kind of knowledge is there, right? And there, there are mu multiple kind of trends or kind of ways how to, how to deal with it. And, but I think we are still on the early stage of actually inter interpret it, interpret, interpreting our models. Because we, uh, for some time, we focus only on accuracy and compromise interpretation. And nowadays, our models are so complicated, so we can't even understand them. So yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. So um, as as we mentioned, uh, that uh, practice is far ahead than theory in machine learning. But actually, you can see some signs of bias when you compare training accuracy with uh, validation accuracy. So you you may see that those signs. Just to clarify a bit on that bias question, recently they've uh, come up with a new set of regulation in Europe that requires that your algorithm to be uh, explicable, or at least that you can interpret them and explain them, them or explain them. So uh, I, I guess my question then is, how do you address the interpretability question? And once you come up with a solution that's highly accurate, but includes information that uh, perhaps addresses biases already present in our society, how do you deal with that problem? And is it something that you're actively addressing? Uh, yes, we do, and uh, we, I can share with you, some, so maybe we can follow up, sh I can share with you some of the techniques that we use for actually trying to understand our models. For instance, you can, you can try to uh, actually uh, kind of train a classifier to classify your res results of your classifier, of your machine learning model, and if you use a model that is, that has this interpretability, for instance, decision trees, you can see w what, what, what will decision to think about your model and try to understand the knowledge, but that's just one of the examples that you, that one of the techniques that can be applied. There are many of them. And I think that for many cases, it's really important. But to your point that in Europe, the, about this regulation, if you mean GDPR, I don't think that there is any, any requirements for interpretation. Maybe for some cases there are, especially healthcare, but generally speaking, uh, I do not remember any. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, there there are some basic rules about it being an interpretable model. So, mm -hmm. uh, black box is no longer allowed. Apparently. It's lucky that we are in the United States, right? <laughs> <laughs> we are lucky. Two more questions. Just following up on the previous quality of data question, I've seen a lot of projects where 80% of the time is actually just wrangling the data frame. Do you have thoughts on tools or techniques around missing values and correlation across columns to actually shorten that period of time, especially mm. in complex data sets? So what I know that, so I would agree that we quite often we spend much more time on uh, data 
data cleansing or actual data preparation, right? And it's a big problem these days, and we try to optimize it. And internally, what, what we do internally, we create some sort of best practices and accelerators that we use to, because we work on many different projects for many different clients, and a lot of things, a lot of routines that are common, right? So we try to package them in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, what we call accelerator that can be applied to detect some some typical types of uh, errors in, in, in data. But generally speaking, it's we always have to look. We, th there's always uh, we always need a human or human expert to look at the data, right? Because we are not experts in any given domain. For instance, if we work in oil and gas, obviously, also we are we have our headquarter office in Austin, Texas, right? But still, we are not that good at oil, at oil and gas, right? So yeah, so some of the ch some of the issues can be tackled with a sort of automated, but many of them we still have to do manually. Hi. So I have a um, you know general question regarding the dilemma when it comes to generalization of models versus you know going for local models in favor of generalization. Uh, when you come across such a scenario. Um, what would you or how would you tackle this problem of favoring one over the other uh, when, let's say, for accuracy's sake, you prefer the local model, but for fitting it to the entire data, you prefer the general model, right? So, I think we always prefer generalized models because generalized models, they actually represent knowledge, and uh, the models that are not generalized, they just represent the data that you have, right? They, they, they don't have any knowledge. So generalization, it's a, one of the key, uh, key actually goals or key objectives for machine learning. It's, to, it's kind of a difference between memorizing things and uh, learning them. So when I was a student, it's quite often I had to prepare for the exam the, the night before the exam, and then the day after the exam, I, I didn't remember anything about what I learned. That's kind of, that's not something that we want to do in machine learning. So last question, if any. All right. So just a quick question, sure. a simple question. Um, when you define problems um, or when you try to solve problems, do you try to do, do you solve, look for problems in industry, across industries? Or do you define machine learning solutions and um, put them out there for clients or people to see if those solutions would suit their problems? So, uh, you know, there are. There are two different kind of directions. There is applied machine learning and research machine learning, right? And since our goal is to help our clients, right, to solve their problems, we uh, we try to uh, we try not to try not to kind of uh, invent a wheel, right? We want to leverage what is available, and it's quite often the case that the problem that you deal with, someone has already kind of already solved, right? And you can leverage for it, for, from it and. Machine learning community is, in general, is highly collaborative because it comes from 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 academia, which is one of the best examples of open source, right? So we first of all we try to see whether whether there is a solution for our problem that we can use right away, because our goal is to solve a business problem, not to invent a new algorithm. And at SoftServe, we collect also business use cases, so there is a, a collection of them and mapping to particular algorithms. So this is kind of uh, a knowledge uh, which we preserve in the company and share with our clients. So the reason I ask this because um, you know if you look at like in financial services sector, for example, there's lots of opportunity and there's lots of data, um, but it looks like a lot of times these solutions are sitting in academia. And if you could articulate like what the you know what your algorithms are and what problems you could solve. Um, you know, I think there is so much opportunity, you know, that is not realized. And if it's, you know, if you're looking for like, sometimes I think maybe just asking for the problem, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, like exploring what the problem is and like you might have an, a model that, you know, or an algorithm that could solve those problems, but it looks like there is a gap, mm -hmm. um, at least I know in financial services. So I'm not sure if you've seen that as well in your use cases or business cases. 
Yeah, sure. So we quite open, uh, quite often hear from our clients the, the question like, how can AI and machine learning help our business? Because there is there is always there is a market. There is a there are competitors and there is a pressure from the market. They want to differentiate. They want to do better than their competitors. And they know that AI and machine learning is quite hot these days. And they want to apply, but they have no idea what will be the best use case. We have our internal methodology that we use to to kind of help them make this initial or first step, right? So we call it ideation workshop. And the goal of this exercise is to, is to kind of come up with a bunch of use cases that can be kind of developed or deployed, right? And then try to estimate them based on their value for, for a particular business and their complexity. Right, and in the, in the end, we'll have we usually have three different groups. Something uh, that is quite easy to implement that will bring a lot of value. We call them quick wins. We have low hanging fruits. Those are uh, those use cases usually don't provide a lot of value, but still it's quite easy to implement them. And must haves. Those are usually something that either your competitors already do or something that will differentiate you because it's so complex and no one ever tried that. And based on this exercise, we create a roadmap for those use cases, prioritize roadmap of AI and ML use cases. All right, so uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great attention and great questions. Thank you.